Praise the Lord. John 17, verses 9 to 19. Sanctify them by the truth. We are still in the middle of uh, going through John 17, the prayer of Jesus to the Father. We talked about the first section where he prays for his glory to be restored. Uh, glory, visible glory that he had before the incarnation. This section, second section, is the section that he prays for his immediate disciples before he leaves the world. And the third section of this prayer is his prayer for all believers, that's us, that's coming. But uh, today we are still in the middle of middle section where he, Jesus prays for his disciples. John 17, verse 9 says, I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those who you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them, and I kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As, for, as you sent me into the world, I have, uh, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, and they too, that they too may be truly sanctified. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you'll open this portion of the scripture to us, so that we may have deeper understanding of you. So that we may be strengthened, so that we may have our uh, purpose, so that we can live for your glory. Strengthen your children for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Usually the way my children, you know by now I have five children, the uh, way we end our night is... Uh, by me praying for them. And, you know, the youngest one, of course, goes to sleep a little early. So I pray for four of them. They say, Daddy, pray for us. So we, I take them into the confined room. And then I pray for them, from the youngest to the oldest. And the youngest one, of course, uh, comes, I pray for her, and she's on her knees, and she's kneeling like this. And the whole space takes about this much. And my great strong hand is upon her, and it covers almost the whole body. And I pray for her. Uh, and then I pray for the older one, older girl, pray for her. Uh, and then uh, the third third one, which is the second oldest boy, I pray for him, and he starts to give prayer requests. Daddy, I have science test, uh, Bible memory test, times test, spelling test, pray for me. <laughs> then I go, oh, okay, uh, what's times test? And he uh, just doesn't know how to answer. Then the older one, of course, answers, uh, you know, as soon as, you know, I say, I ask a question, he always answers. I don't know why. And he goes, Daddy, multiplication. Oh, okay. Daniel, that's not time test, so multiplication test. And we pray again. We pray for them. Uh, and then I pray for them all. While I, I think I'm done, the youngest one, whom I pray for the first time, says, Can we pray again? Because uh, I like praying. Then the two oldest boys run out of the room. 
before I apply and answers the request. So the two girls, I pray again, you know, just over here, hand and pray. And, and then when I pray for the oldest daughter, she's about six, I think. They keep changing the age. I, I think she's about six. So I pray for her. And she, before I pray, she goes like this, Daddy, you know, when you're praying for Joshua, when you're praying, you kissed him like this. So can you pray exactly like that and kiss me like that too? She observes everything and makes sure she's loved the same way. Then I'm filled with love. My heart is all mushy now. And then I lay my hand and I feel like saying, these guys are mine. And I pray for blessings. Uh, why am I talking about this? I think that's what this chapter is like. Uh, if you... Uh, if, if I say, and whenever I say these things, many uh, of you want to say, Pastor, can I go into your room while you pray for your children? Just for the entertainment value. You want to come in and stuff like that. But how much more would you like to be in a room where Jesus prays to his Father? It's a family prayer. And this is a portion of the scripture where Jesus pours his heart to the Father in the family prayer. Do you want to see the proof of that? Look how many times Jesus says, Father. He mentions it six times in this chapter. Verse 1, he says, Father, the time has come. Uh, verse 5, it says, Father, glorify me. Uh, verse 11, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. Uh, verse 21, and all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Uh, verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. Verse 25, Righteous Father. Six times he says, Father. It's a family prayer where Jesus prays to his Father. Uh, to understand this prayer, there's so much in the passage. I decided to explain four things, four things. Uh, so that if you understand these four things that I'm going to talk about, uh, I think you can understand his prayer much better. Uh, so uh, four things are this. First of all, you have to understand this phrase, Holy Father. Holy Father. Secondly, uh, Holy Son. Thirdly, Holy Children. And then fourthly, the Holy Word. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Children, uh, and Holy Word. First of all, Holy Father. It says in verse 11, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. Uh, under this point, you have to understand three things. The word holy, and the, the word name, and the word father. Holy, name, father. We have to understand these things to understand what Holy Father means. First of all, what does it mean by holy? To understand the phrase Holy Father. Uh, it could mean moral purity. Like holiness is moral purity. Of course it, it's that too. But it's much more than that. Primarily the word holy means total separation. Absolute separation. Meaning not just God is so far away but far above. Absolute separation from anything else. Because he's so transcendent. He's so great, so awesome, nothing can even come close to be compared to. Incomparable personhood, greatness of God. So that's why any being that sees God face to face will say, Holy, 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 great, awesome, mighty, incomparable is our God. That's what they're saying. Holy, holy, holy. Angels uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, Revelation chapter 22, when they, uh, Revelation chapter 5, chapter 7, say holy, holy, holy. Three times means completion of it. Completely separate from anything else. That's how any being that sees God face to face praises because he's so great, so awesome, totally separate, tr totally transcendent. Great is our God. Now, God's moral purity, uh, that's what part of holiness means, is one of the smaller attributes of his, that greatness, that separateness, transcendence of God. For example, when you say MJ, Michael Jordan, you can say he's a pretty good basketball player. That's true and obvious, but 
I think by now his name means more than that. His name means he has that aura of greatness. Uh, unmatchable greatness as an athlete or even as a celebrity. Uh, so part of holiness means, sure, uh, it's moral purity, but it has that aura of greatness that we need to understand. It's like you, you can say Mother Teresa was a pretty good nurse. That's true and obvious, but she has more sense of that aura of sacrifice, person of sacrifice, person of love. Uh, that's what uh, holiness means. He's so transcendent, far above, great, awesome God. That's what holy means. Holy Father. And it says in uh, verse 11, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. You have to understand the word name. What is name? Name is not just someone that you refer to. Name mentioned here is Holy Father. Name is used for everything which the name covers. Everything, uh, the, the thought or feeling of which is aroused in mind by mentioning or hearing or remembering the name. For example, one's rank, one's authority, one's uh, interests, pleasure, command, excellences, de uh, deeds are all mentioned when you talk about the name. So it's talking about the person when you say the name. So when we pray in Jesus' name, we pray in uh, the person of Jesus, not just the word J-S-U-S, name. So what does it mean when he says, protect them by the power of your name? Holy Father, as he prays for the disciples, protect them by the power of your name. So name is a person, but it's even more than that, I think. Whenever name is given, God gives a name, more of the personhood of God is given in that moment of redemptive history. In that moment of history, in redemptive history, when God gives a new name, that means new aspect of God, more of aspect of God, is revealed to his people, and that's who he will be to them, even from that moment on. So it's almost like a promise of God. Promise of God. Uh, it means that when he gives a name, that's who he will be to the ones he's giving that promises to. That's who he is. So what is that name that Jesus is giving or using to protect us? Verse 11 says, Holy Father. Father is the name. That's why six times in this text, the Father is mentioned. Think about that. That great, awesome, amazing God is our Father. Because Jesus Christ died in our behalf. That means Jesus Christ came to this world. To give their name to us by dying for us on the cross. Give their name so that we can call him Father. Holy Father. That's what the Holy Father means. Holy Father. That great and awesome God is his name to us. He's protecting us, guiding us, loving us. That objective promise, protection is given to us as subjective assurance that he's our Holy Father. So you have to understand that. Secondly, you have to understand Holy Son, the Holy Son. Uh, Jesus Christ, as you know, is the Son of God. Now, and we can be called children of God, sons, sons and daughters of God. How is it different? Is there a difference between us and Jesus? Of course. Uh, Jesus is the Son of God in a way that no one else is. So when John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only one and only NIV translation says, King, King James translation says, only begotten son. I think the correct translation is uh, one and only is right. Uh, God gave his only unique son. That's what it means. Egeneto means only unique son. Why is he only unique son? He's son of God ever since the eternity began. And we are children of God by adoption through our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of Jesus and God sees us through Jesus, that we are adopted children of God, but Son of God. Jesus Christ was, ever since the eternity began, had that relationship with the Father, and no one else is like that. Son of God means Son has all the characteristics of the Father. Okay? So my children have my DNA in them, mother's and father's DNA in them. So that means I'm a human being. That means my children, as you know, are human beings. 
Just like the Son of God means he has all the DNA of deity. That Son of God is, has all the characteristics of the Father, deity of the Father. So he's a unique son. He's, he's son who is God. Uh, and what does it mean when he says in verse 11, the Holy Father protected by the power of your name, the name you gave me. Then what does it mean when Jesus says to the Father, the name you gave me? Well, name, as we talked about, was the name Father. How did Father give the Son the name Father? Well, uh, before the incarnation, before Jesus Christ came into the world, uh, their relationship was unnamed relationship. That eternal love, that eternal unity of one another, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, was unnamed until Jesus was coming to this world with a mission that he's going to give that uh, he's going to save his people, and that mission is going to be that he's going to be the Son of God. So he, to explain to us so that we can understand, uh, Jesus is given the name, uh, the Father's name. Father, God's name, the Father. It's like uh, Calvin said, Bible is a baby talk. So for us to understand, he gives such a simple language to us in a way that our souls and our uh, human beings can understand. And he's revealing uh, who God is to us, the Father. So son dies now we have so that he would give the name to us for those people who would believe in him. And it sets, apart, sets him apart as a mission that he came to this world to give that name, God's name, Father, to us. How does he do that? Look at this in verse 19. It says, For them I sanctify myself. I sanctify myself. What does it mean? The word sanctify is the same word as I make myself holy. It says, I sanctify myself. I make myself holy. What does that mean? Of course, it doesn't mean that Jesus makes himself more morally pure because Jesus is already holy. Jesus is already morally pure. He's sinless. So what does he mean when he says, I sanctify myself? It's that second meaning we talked about. He separates himself. It's a separateness. So I sanctify myself there means three things. One is, I separate myself for my father. I separate myself for my father. Father has a purpose and will, and he has mission for me, so I separate myself. I sanctify myself for my father to give that name father to uh, the sinners who, who will die otherwise. I separate myself for my father. Also, it means I separate myself from my father. Listen carefully. First was I separate myself for my father to do his will. Second is, I separate myself from my father. It's the same thing. When he says, I separate for myself for my father, that he would die in our behalf. And when he dies on the cross, what is he doing? He carries all the sins of this world. So he's separating himself from the father. It's the same thing. Talk about the same thing for two different sides of the coin. I sanctify myself. That's what it means. I separate myself for my father. I separate myself from my father. But thirdly, also it means I separate myself for you, all the believers in Jesus. That's what he's saying, verse 19. For them, I sanctify myself. Why is he doing that? Why is he doing the will of God? Why is he uh, separating himself from the father? It says, for them to save us, that we would be in place of Jesus, the father's children. To give that name to us so that we be saved. To reveal the Father's name to us. So implanted in us is, is the relationship with the Father by the Holy Spirit that we become his children. We transform and change to be more like Christ that we represent him. Uh, that we become holy children. So that's the gospel. Think about that. I sanctify myself. That's like summary of the gospel. Jesus separates himself for the will of God. Jesus separates himself from the Father. Jesus separates himself for us so that we be like him. We be his children. Which naturally leads to the third point. The holy children. Talk about holy father, holy son, holy children. So because of Lord Jesus Christ, we receive the benefit of Christ's sanctification. Verse 19, it says, I sanctify myself. 
And then the passage talks about like five benefits of Christ's sanctification. Why? How Christ sanctified himself. How Christ separates himself. Uh, first benefit is written in verse 10. That we become God's children. Well, look at verse 10. It says, all I have is yours. <laughs> He's talking about, mainly talking about us and the disciples. Ones who will believe in Jesus. All I have is yours and all you have is mine. Jesus is basically saying, because he died in our behalf, all the believers are, as he refers to us, mine. <laughs> like when I pray for my children, my, my heart is so filled with my children, I feel like saying, mine. <laughs> uh, because of love, not because of selfishness, because of love. But I think that's what God is saying. That's what Jesus is saying. Benefit, one of the benefits of his sanctification that he separates himself is that he calls us mine. Second benefit is written in verse 11 and 12, that we are protected by the Father. Verse 11, it says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. Verse 12, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name. Because of Jesus, that name is implanted in us, that God is our Father. That means no matter what we go through in our lives, that he will protect us. As father, as father would uh, do everything for their children, our God becomes our father and he's protecting us, guiding us, loving us. Even though we may be walking through the valleys of shadow of death, he'll be with us. We do not have to worry because through those valleys of shadow of death, he's leading us to the green pasture to feed us, guide us, help us to grow. Third benefit, of course, is that we experience children's joy. Verse 13, it says... Uh, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm, I am still in the world, so that, why is he doing this? So that they may have the full measure of my joy. My joy. What joy of Christ? Well, that eternal joy because of eternal love that Father has from that complete love and eternal love. That love relationship between the Father and the Son and the joy that comes out of that. That complete love, love that cannot be, get any better than the love that the son had for the father. And because of that, he had joy. That joy is what Jesus is talking about when he says, my joy. And he says, that joy can be planted within us. My joy within them. As we trust in Christ and God loves us with his son's love for his, love for his son, that we experience that completeness of that joy. My joy, Jesus' joy is planted in us as he receives that complete and eternal love. Fourth benefit of that uh, sanctification is that because Christ sanctified himself, we can be sanctified. We can change. Verse 17, sanctify them by the truth. Because Christ sanctified himself, we, we can be sanctified. We can change. Verse 19, for them I sanctify myself. Why? That they too may be truly sanctified. That means we can change because Christ died in our behalf. We are still, be, even though we trust in Christ, we become Christian. We are part rebels, part children. But slowly but surely, we are going to the direction of becoming true children of God. Just as, just as it says, they too may be truly be sanctified. Uh, we become his children. We are protected by the Father. We experience children's joy. We are, we are changed. We are being changed to become his children. But also fifth benefit of sanctification is written in verse 18 that we are separated uh, to represent Christ uh, as, a, as part of our mission. Verse 18, it says, it says as you sent me into the world, Father sent the Son, I sent them into the world. Now we have a purpose. We can represent Christ. He's continuously changing us, helping us to experience the joy because now we are his children and he's protecting us by the name of the Father. We are content continuously being transformed by Christ and as we do that, we can participate in the mission of God. We can participate in the family business of expanding his kingdom of our father king how does it how does it look like what does it look like that when we are in the world we become different we change we live like his children we live like uh, the sons and daughters 
of God. We, we live like Christian. I can explain it like this. Uh, like 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 says, We become holy nation. The word holy is used. Separated nation. I mean, it means separated, separated ethnic group. I think that will speak to us because we have different ethnic groups in our church. As I said uh, even last week, even among the Asians, a lot of Asians in our church. Uh, and some Asians are more Americanization, some Americanized, some, some Asians are still Asianizations. <laughs> and, you know, even, even among the Asians, different uh, culture that we have. Think about culture. Uh, culture means like different language. It could be different language. Uh, different joke, different humor. I'm like torn when I watch TV and when I read poetry. It's all related with your heart language. Language and humor, I think, tells a lot about culture. So when I read like American poetry and American humor, it's kind of funny. But more funny to me is like uh, Korean jokes and Korean poetry. When I read Korean poetry, my nose starts to tingle. Why? Because, uh, you know, your heart language, my heart language is Korean. So when I read something related to that, it touches my emotion more. So one thing I cannot get is British humor. So when I watch like British, I understand every word that they're saying is just not funny to me. Funny to me. Everybody's laughing. I'm, I want to laugh too, but I just can't laugh because it's not funny to me. I understand uh, because it's a culture thing. Language, culture, humor, food, what you eat. I go to different countries and speaks to different pastors. And they just, just, they eat different things. Their attitude is different. Their whole perspective in life is different. Uh, the way they talk, tone of the voice, uh, how you greet people, it's all part of the culture. Now what am I saying? When you become Christian, you have different culture. You become holy ethnic group. Uh, you have Different. You become different. The way you look at things, uh, things that used to be funny may not be funny anymore. You become different. You become holy nation for the Lord. You change what used to interest you, what used to make you cry, what used to, what you used, used to make you happy is different. That means, let's say you, if you're a, you just came from China and you became a Christian, uh, and then you're an American Christian, now... Chinese Christian doesn't necessarily mean after they become Christian, they like to eat cheese already. No, that may not mean that. But even though that kind of culture may not change, somehow, for some reason, when that Chinese person becomes a Christian, that person, even though culturally many things are different than American who's been here as a Christian, might have more commonality because of the transformation that has taken place in their hearts than someone who's born in China. Why? Because when Christ comes into our hearts, we become different. Slowly but surely, change takes place, and we become holy children, holy ethnic group, holy nation. And what transforms us, what interests us, and what changes us, what moves us, becomes different. Why? Because we're in a different family. We are in the family of God. God is our Father. And because of our Lord Jesus Christ, we become family of God. That's the only reason I think we can gather together and worship together and love one another. While there's so much difference in our lives, we can love one another because we become children of God. Fourth thing, we talked about the Holy Father, Holy Son. Thirdly, Holy Children. Fourthly, the Holy Word. What transforms us? What changes us? How does it make us holy people? Very simple. It says, sanctify them by the truth. Separate them by the truth. Hmm? Uh, the means to make us his children, truly becoming children, is the word of God. Think about the phrase, sanctify them by the truth. Two things are in there, right? Of course, truth, the word of God, the Bible, the scripture, holy Bible, holy scripture, as well as in that very sentence, he's praying. Sanctify them by the truth. Prayer and the word of God. How does it work? You know, when the word of God goes into our hearts, we need to pray. Because prayer gives power to that word. 
So as we read God's word, we need to pray. That's what, exactly what he's saying. Sanctify them by the truth. He's praying to the Father that the word that will go into the disciples will have power. So we become transformed and changed. So three things about the word I'll say. It has to be the word. It has to be the Bible. Not Shakespeare. It has to be the Bible. It and if it's a Bible, it will sanctify us. Secondly, thirdly, we have to internalize these words. Those three things. It has to be the Word of God. If the Word of God goes into us, it will sanctify us. Thirdly, we have to internalize, really take it into our soul, the Word. I'll illustrate with some things and make sense out of it. It has to be the Word of God. It's like this. Let's say you want to talk to someone you really care about. I want to talk to her. So you're walking around and you want to call your, uh, you know, fiancé or something like that. So you go to the refrigerator and say, honey, you don't, do, you don't go to the refrigerator and say that. You don't go to the TV and say, honey, <laughs> you don't go to the toilet and say, honey, you don't do that. What do you do? You pick up a telephone. And what do you do? You pick up a telephone and you close your eyes and you push any number and say, Honey, who is this? <laughs> you don't do that, no. You pick up the telephone and you know her cell phone number, 390. <laughs> number. And then you say, Hello. Oh, I missed your voice. What's my point? <clears throat> <laughs> to talk to someone you love, you need to use the right instrument. Okay? And that when God wants to speak to us, only thing he uses is the word of God. Okay? Word of God. Word of God is the right instrument. Now that's the instrument that he uses, but... Our heart has to, has to respond. He pushes the right number, and we have to receive the call of God. Okay? We need to receive it. And in that interaction, as we read the word of God and we receive his call, that fellowship takes place, place, that love relationship takes place. That's why it has to be the word of God. It says, sanctify them by the truth. Okay? We have to read God's word. It has to be the word of God. That's the instrument that he uses to call us. Uh, the second thing is that if we do that, if we, if we use the word of God, it will sanctify us. What does it mean that it sanctifies us? Uh, sheep eats grass. I think that's true. Uh, snake eats frogs. Mice. Things like that. Praying mantis eats her husband. Uh, so does some human being, but, you know, praying mantis eats husband. Uh, heart eats the word of God. God has made Christian's heart in a way that we eat God's word. And sanctify means we grow. We come alive. We get to love God. God made man eat food. God made heart eat the word of God. That's why we live by the every word that comes from the mouth of God. It has to be the word, and it will sanctify us. It will help us to grow. Third thing is, we have to internalize it. We have to meditate and apply. It has to be part of us. Then we grow. Let me ask you this question. How many of you consider yourself a coffee drinker? Let me, can I see hands? Put your hand up. When I say coffee drinker, I don't mean that you put a lot of sweet stuff and flavor stuff and you drink it in your coffee drinker. I don't mean that you cannot tell the, distinguish the difference between the good cafe coffee and gas station coffee. You know the difference. You know what I'm talking about? All the coffee drinkers. 
How many of you consider yourself a coffee drinker? I, I remember talking to this guy who was riding on a motorcycle for the first time, and he, was, he stopped at a red light somewhere, and then there's this guy with, uh, over there from the opposite side with a tattoo and a Harley Davidson. <laughs> you, know, you can't hear anything else. And he's, when he saw this guy who's on a motorcycle, it was a small thing, he looked at him straight. They really understood each other, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I mean by coffee drinker? How many of you are coffee drinkers? I remember the first time I drank coffee was when my mom said, drink this coffee, and I drank coffee, and she said, no, 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 that's not how you drink it. You, you're supposed to sip it a little bit, and then you have to enjoy and look around. So I said, okay. <laughs> I sipped, and then I looked around. I just still didn't like the coffee. But one time in college when I drank coffee, and what I realized was as I drank it and tasted it, what happened was when coffee went through my esophagus, and then what I did was I read from an article that you, when you drink coffee, you have to breathe in, breathe out. Then what happens is that savor and the flavor goes into your brain and into your stomach, and you really get to enjoy it. It sounds like I'm teaching you how to enjoy drug or something like that. You're going up and down, and then... You can enjoy the savor of your coffee, and then you, you, and then you look around, and everything looks so whoa. <laughs> Actually, you know, the reason why you enjoy drug is, uh, you know, it's a cheap substitute of what you're supposed to, as you enjoy and have fellowship with God, that you're supposed to have this uh, heart met with the joy, but it's a cheap substitute of that. And at that time, I understood what my mom said. You know, sip a little bit and look around. Oh, she did not really talk about the internal aspect of it. And then I taught this to my, uh, one of the pastors. I'll mention the name, Pastor Milo. He was one of those guys who had to put a lot of flavor stuff in the coffee and drink it in this gourmet coffee. You're ruining the coffee. And I told him, sip a little bit and then breathe in and breathe out and let it go into your brain and then go into your heart and you know but don't breathe in while you drink it close your epiglottis and then you know drink it and then close it and then enjoy the flavor so he did that a few times and then he, he said oh this is what you're supposed to do so after a few days he came back and said uh, you know I drank this coffee from this place I'm not gonna mention the name coffee place this place didn't taste it like that I couldn't taste it I said now you're becoming a coffee drinker because you can distinguish between good coffee and gas station coffee. Now you're a coffee drinker. What am I saying? This That's how you're supposed to enjoy the Word of God. <laughs> you read it. You taste it. You chew it. You meditate and breathe in and breathe out and think about all the circumstances and look around and then enjoy the savor of God's Word. It will make you come alive. Uh, look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. I, I lost it in the first service, but look at verse 11. It says, uh, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that, it says, look at this phrase, they may be one as we are one. Meaning, if you know how to eat the word of God, you experience the unity. They may be one as we are one. Harley riders have understanding of each other. Coffee drinkers have understanding of each other. Word eaters have understanding of each other. That's what it means. You change, you transform, your culture changes. You start to see things differently. You experience the word of God. And you are transformed and changed. And you are becoming more like Christ. Then you can represent him in this world. We eat the truth and it sanctifies us. It makes us come alive. Being holy means come alive. Being sanctified means come alive. That's why it's the word of life. You, are, you become dead to sin and alive. We become more like Christ. We grow. We are sanctified. We are being set up, sanctified, separated for the mission of God, for His glory, for His honor, so that we can give that name to someone else that needs it. Uh, even the world might hate us, and Satan will try to destroy us, as the passage says. But the word will make us strong, 
and loving. We will become someone who can represent him. So even the world might hate us, he says, we love because of who we are, not because of what they are. We love because of who we are, how we are being transformed. We respond to God's love, not their hatred. Uh, we, become, we don't become reactive. We become proactive. Just because what, how, if they hate us, we react and we hate back. We are reacting. No, no, no. No matter what they do, we are proactive. We represent God. We love them like our Holy Father. The point is, as the Word of God goes into our hearts and we enjoy the savor of God's Word, it transforms us. And we don't, more so than our utterance of, of, of presenting the gospel, we become the presentation of the gospel. We become the children of God. Well, that's the strategy and the plan of God. And that's what he's praying. So, we pray to the Lord. Uh, trusting the name. Father, sanctify us for your glory. Let's pray. Think about even some of the phrases or portion of the scripture. And breathe in and breathe out. Enjoy the savor of God's word. Word eaters have understanding of each other. Taxi drivers have understanding of each other. Truck drivers and bus drivers, you see them on a bus. They always shake hands or wave to one another. They have understanding of each other. Word eaters have understanding of each other. Oh, savor the flavor of God's word, saints of God, children of God. Respond to his call. He calls you every day. He's pushing your number. Answer the call. Make some commitments to read God's word. Father is calling you to speak to you, talk to you. Relate with you. Answer the call. Make some commitments. Ten minutes a day, five minutes a day, chapter a day. Make some commitment to read and meditate. Enjoy the savor of God's word. That you be his children, he be your father. Holy Father. That we become different ethnic group. Different kind. We march in the beat of different drum. We like different music. We have different reason. We see the world differently. We see our enemies differently. Transform me, O oh Lord. Transform my heart. Change me. Help me to grow. Sanctify me for your glory. Let's pray. That prayer, sanctify us by your truth. That the word will have power to change us. Let's pray to the Lord for a few minutes.
Lord, we thank you that you are working in us. You are transforming us. Continue to sanctify us by the truth so that we may be your children that will represent you. We are so thankful, Lord. We have a long way to go, but you are still working within our hearts. Continue to work within us. Strengthen your people for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we rise and sing that even though we are incomplete, He is not through with us yet. He is continuously sanctifying us by the truth. Continue to eat and savor the word of God. My open heart, I offer up my life. I look to you, Lord. Your love that never ends restores me again. So I lift my eyes to you. strength will I break through, Lord, touch me now, let your love fall down on me, I know your love dispels all my fears, through the storm I will hold on, Lord. And by faith I will walk on, Lord, then I'll see beyond my Calvary one day, and I will be complete in you. sacrifice my open heart I offer up my life I look to you Lord your love that never ends restores me again so I lift my eyes to you complete in you so I let my eyes to you Lord in your strength will I break through Lord touch me now let your love fall down All my fears through the storm, I will hold on, Lord, and by faith I will walk on. 
cross he thought of me above all and uh, I think the text says that I sanctify myself for them so every time I think about this song because he did that in my heart Lord that you be my Lord above all let's sing it above all power Above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Lay behind the stone You lived and died Rejected and alone Like a rose Trampled on the ground You took the fall And thought of me Above all, above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom. In all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known. Above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind the stone, you live to die, rejected. And alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground, you took the fall, and 
Rejected and alone Like a rose Trampled on the ground You took the fall And thought of me Above all You were crucified Laid behind the stone Rejected and alone Like a rose Trampled on the ground You took the fall And thought of me Above all Like a rose Trampled on the ground You took the fall And thought of me Above all Let's pray and give Him thanks and ask you to make some commitment to maybe to read the Word of God Maybe five minutes a day, chapter a day, make some commitment to answer his call. Every day he's calling, wanting to speak to you, answer his call. And fellowship with him to be transformed, to live for his glory. Let's pray to the Lord for a few minutes. And I'll end it with a benediction. thank you and praise you that you are a separated father and your son willingly separated himself to do your will so that we be separated people may the word of God come into our hearts to continue to sanctify us and separate us for your mission, for your purpose, for your glory, to represent you for your honor. We pray that you make us more strong people, loving people, so that we may love others, not because of what they do and what they are, but because of who we are and who we are becoming, who you you are transforming in us so that you can be honored and glorified through us. Strengthen your people. Help us to persevere. Till you return, may the word of God never end, entering into our hearts. Help us to enjoy the savor of God's word so that we be transformed, become your children, to live for the glory of our heavenly Father, fulfilling and accomplishing his family business. Strengthen your people for your glory. As we pray that within our hearts, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, awesome and incredible love of our God, unending koinonia, fellowship, strengthening, empowerment of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forever and evermore. All God's children said, Amen.